the ordinary life, as you know, if you saw the slides that were up, is an educational offering of St. Paul's, and the Curly Endowment grew out of that. And I want to thank the people who started that and who support that because that's what makes this evening possible. Um, for those of you who are visiting here for the first time, you can tell that our cathedral building is under massive renovation. So uh, come back. Come back this Sunday at 9.45. You don't have to go to the big church if you don't want to. <laughs> but just come here and get a taste of, of what ordinary life is all about. Um, some of you uh, have heard what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. This past Christmas, I had time off like other people, and... I decided to catch up on some email, and in the process of doing that, I read some interviews on um, Progressive Spirit site, which is the website that used to publish uh, Bishop John Shelby Spong's messages. And uh, Michael, Shelby Spong actually spoke in this room several years ago. And um, so I, I read these interviews with this guy named Michael Morewood, whom I had never heard of, and uh, I got energized, like hearing Ilya Delio and Brian Swim and some other people of late. And I thought, I wonder if this guy's got any books. So I got on Amazon and found out he has nine books. But I got on Amazon and found two that I could download immediately to my e-reader, my Kindle, and I devoured them. And then I thought, I wonder if this guy's got a website. So I checked that out, and he did. And... I contacted him and I said, I'm in Houston and this is what I do. And I sent him a, a link to one of the talks on our website and he said, this sounds interesting, like we're on kind of the same page. I'd love to have a time to come to Houston, but I'm, I can't in 2019, maybe 2020. I said, okay, we'll look for a time to do that. I'd like to do that. And then a few weeks later, he sent me an email saying, it might be possible for me to stop on the way from Phoenix to New York and spend the evening in uh, St. Paul. So that's what he is doing. We picked him up at the airport today. Anyway, he has spoken to me, and um, he has over 40 years of experience in adult faith development. And he may or may not tell you part of that story. If he doesn't in his presentation, I will qu quiz him about that afterwards. He's going to speak. For about 25 minutes, we'll stand up and take a stretch. Another 25 minutes, and we'll take a longer break. The early birds have probably already eaten all the cookies. <laughs> but we will take a break. And during that time, uh, Holly Hudley uh, has gotten pens and cards. Some are out on the table, and some you can distribute uh, later. If you have questions that you would like to uh, ask Michael, if you would write those down, then Holly will curate those questions, and we will have a Q&A period, and we'll end up about 9 o'clock as agreed. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. To be good format for us. We are having uh, so much wonderful opportunity to absolutely rethink everything in light of the new cosmology. And for some people, that's terrifying. And for some people, it's really exciting. And I hope we come out on the side of excitement tonight. I am so glad to introduce to you Michael Morewood. Michael? Thank you very much. I lack something in height, so if I stand here, you may be able to see me better. Okay. I'm so delighted to be here. And I, I spent most of the last half hour downstairs watching you come in. And it was so delightful, so thrilling to see a, a group like this come to an evening like this. So, so thank you for coming. I'm going to try to do in an hour what I would normally take a week to do. <laughs> so please understand, this is condensing rather severely. This extraordinary change that we are all living through at the moment reshaping religious imagination, religious thinking, which is so threatening to a lot of people, 
but must be done, not just for the future of the church, but for the future of humanity. This is not just a religious question. This reshaping will affect the future of humanity. It is as serious as that. And it will be resisted quite strongly from many institutional churches. In the mid-1980s, I did my master's program at Boston College and I focused on processes of adult faith education and I learned to ask three key questions about developing faith amongst adults, exploring faith. And the first question is, what are you asking me to imagine? Not, not as like imagination, but what are you asking me to imagine as like a picture of reality, that this is real? And the second question to ask is, where did this imagination come from? What gave rise to this way of thinking, this understanding of, of reality? And then the third question is probably the most subversive question, and that is, how does this imagination, this religious thinking picture of reality, how does it conform to what I know in the 21st century about the universe, its age, its size, about this planet, and about how life developed on this planet? And in terms of religious imagination and religious belief, especially among Christians, there are three key issues. Who, what, where is this G-O-D reality? What are you asking me to imagine when you talk about a God? What have we been led to imagine as almost a, a, a picture of, of reality? The second question, and who is Jesus? And what have we been, been given again as imagination, a picture of reality? This is who Jesus of Nazareth is, especially for Christians. How is this G-O-D, how does this reality reveal, you could say, himself or itself to us? What were we taught? What were we led to imagine? We'll look at this very briefly. And then the question, who are we? And how are we in relationship with this great mystery, this whatever G-O-D points to? What was I taught as a small boy about who I am in relationship with God? As a Roman Catholic, I said the prayer every day that I was a poor, banished child of Eve, mourning and weeping in a valley of tears. We sing at funerals, we are wretches to be saved. It's not a nice picture, is it? And then the, the final great area of exploration that we'll look at tonight, worship. What are you asking me to imagine? There's a God in the heavens who looks down and sees that we gather for worship and worship is for God's sake. Again, growing up Roman Catholic, you know, if we didn't go to Mass on Sundays, wow, you know, God got angry. What is worship about? Who was worship for? What have we been led to imagine as a picture of reality not to be questioned? What is prayer about? For, for whose sake is prayer? If I go into almost any Christian church, I hear prayers addressed to God. What are you asking me to imagine? Is someone out there listening? I grew up believing that. 
These are not simple questions, they're not, they're not simple issues. They are the most engaging, important issues confronting religion today. And if we don't confront them, then I think institutional religion will not have a future. So let me just very briefly, again, I have to jump through very quickly. If we go back thousands of years ago, most people thought the earth was flat. But indigenous people had a sense, characterised by that overlay, that there was a sort of numinous presence everywhere. It was in the rivers, it was in the trees, it's in the animals, it's in the mountains. Whether here among the, the native Indian population of this country or the Aboriginal population of Australia. But they had a sense that, 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 that something greater than us and all powerful was here. And then what I call the great original sin is taking that reality and putting it in the heavens. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. And the one that probably affects Christianity most is, is the Greek philosophy, Plato, you know, pu putting it up there. And then the development of, it's not the stars and stripes because I'm in the United States, but it's representing gods, that the gods were in the heavens. And of course, once you put the gods in the heavens, then what you needed was middle management. <laughs> yeah, middle management. It could control the gods and tell us. And then the development that affects us, of course, is the development amongst the Hebrew people of one almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful, the only God, Yahweh. Male, of course, male. And if we change the scenario even to the from the flat earth to the round earth. This picture of reality is the, the picture that has cemented Christian thought for the last 2,000 years in the Nicene Creed, in our doctrines, in our prayer, in our understanding of revelation, in our understanding of who Jesus is. That God is mainly a personal being in the sky, external to us, that this God, the God of our scriptures, whether it's the scriptures of the Hebrews or the scriptures of the Christian church, God is mainly in heaven and God reveals himself and revealed himself to one group of people. It's the most divisive, elitist idea that religion could possibly carry. Because we have God and you don't. And you buy into that story, you, 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 you literalise the Adam and Eve story and you buy into literally a story of disconnection. And the Christian church for the last 2,000 years, all of its Christology has been a theology of disconnection from a God who locked us out and about a Jesus who is the incarnation of a God in the heavens come down to earth, lived amongst us, and who somehow by his life and his death and rising from the dead, and he goes back up into heavens, and hallelujah, we are saved. I'd have to be careful in most Christian churches, wouldn't I? <laughs> hey? This notion of a God who locked us out of heaven and who then are we? The Christian church has carried for almost 2,000 years the idea that we were born in a state of utter separation from this God. And only if you came into this institution that God spoke to, that God talked to, could you win access and go to heaven. And with that, of course, the idea that, that heaven is somewhere else. And that life is like a trial. If we, if we lived properly, did the right things, then when we died, then we would go to where God really is in heaven. And most of our liturgical prayer is addressed to a heavenly deity. The idea of worship comes from the Hebrew scriptures 
and it comes from this notion of a God in heaven who rules. And of course the other thing in here is what I mentioned a moment ago is the idea of middle management. Because middle management then keeps the institution and its members locked into this notion that we have the power, the unique access to this God and you had better do what we tell you to do because if you don't, you're not going to go up. You're going to go down to Australia. <laughs> down under, huh? But everybody knows that Australia's on top of the world. Come on. Okay. <laughs> but see, when we go to heaven, well, we're going up, and I don't know where you're going anymore. Okay. So this has been locked into a package, and what I call this package is institutional theology. That most of the theology that I grew up with is theology for the sake of institution identity, and for the sake of institution power. And don't you dare cross it. And if you critique that theology, if you were to say, I no longer believe the, the Nicene Creed, then we have thrown at us, oh, well, you can't be a Christian anymore. What it simply means is that you're offside with institutional theology. But don't tell me, don't tell me I'm not a follower of Jesus of Nazareth and I'm ready to commit my life to his message and to what he was ready to die for. Don't tell me that, because you don't know me. But yes, I don't say the creed anymore, because it belongs to that worldview, and it's not my worldview anymore. Nor is it the worldview of your children and your grandchildren. It's not the future worldview. And we should not be surprised that in our lifetime, we are seeing the greatest exodus ever from institutional church. Because the young don't believe it anymore. They don't believe the story. The story of redemption of a God who locked us out. So now comes the challenge. How can we change all that? How, how can we turn upside down? How can I move away from the package I no longer believe in, and yet somehow, somehow still have a sense of the great mystery that G.O.D. points to. Somehow still want to gather around the story of Jesus because now it's more important to me then now than it ever was. And how can I come to an understanding of revelation that now makes, wow, that makes sense. And how can I come to an understanding of who we are in relationship with this great mystery that I find just awesome and inspiring and full of wonder? That's our task. And in all of that, then what is prayer about? And why do we gather on Sundays? If I don't answer that by the end of my talk tonight, then I've failed. That's my challenge. If we started with what we just knew in the 21st century, if we started with a photo from the Hubble telescope, and they tell us that the Hubble telescope looked at a dark area of the sky, not knowing what was there, and it was the equivalent if you held a five cent piece at arm's length and you took a photo of that area of the dark sky, which they did over several nights. And when they developed the photo, they discovered 10 thousand galaxies in that area of the sky. You know, I like to imagine 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. And there are billions and billions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of galaxies out there, and each of them with trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of stars. This is the start of theology in the 21st century. This is, the, this is real. This is a picture. This is real. So what now do I do with G-O-D? If I were teaching in a primary school, I'd hope I'd you know, educate children to a stage where I could say, would someone come out the front and tell me where you think G-O-D is? 
And no one's going to come out and say, oh, I think G-O-D is up there looking down. No, because there's no up there anymore. Whatever G-O-D is, it's not hovering above the earth. Whatever G-O-D is, it's not localised. It's not a localised person thinking with all sorts of ideas and pulling strings. So I go to science and I ask the scientists, as you look at this, do you have a sense of wonder? Do you have a sense of amazement? Do you have a sense of something moving that is beyond your comprehension and our comprehension? We shouldn't be surprised that a lot of scientists say, well, I don't believe in God anymore. Well, of course they don't. But do I have a sense of wonder and a sense of amazement? Of course they do. Mind, consciousness, something operating all through the universe since the Big Bang. And I'll come back to this in a moment. So as someone then wanting to move from uh, you know, an understanding of, of God and saying, no, that doesn't fit anymore, but, but let G-O-D point to something now. Then I use this overlay and I go back into imagination to what I learned as a small Catholic Christian boy. And I would guarantee that every one of us in this room tonight that we've heard this. God is everywhere. We've all heard that. G-O-D, whatever G-O-D points to, it's everywhere. So let me use this pink overlay. Well, it's not so pink now, but it's... So now I'm dealing with a reality, not as the Hebrew people understood, not as St Paul understood, as a God in the heavens who could lock us out, now I'm using my understanding of reality to point to an awesome mystery beyond my comprehension that G-O-D can still point to. And I'll come back to this as the source, the sustainer, the reality that holds everything in existence so that outside of that overlay there is nothing because nothing exists outside of G-O-D. I learnt that in the seminary. But there are reasons why I got mixed up about it. And so, you know, I could put Hubble pictures up for the next half hour. What are we dealing with in the 21st century if you want to talk about God? And many people now will say, no, God, Lang, God, the word God is obsolete because it, it, it's too much tied to a past the world view, but don't throw it away. Let us now use it to point to the great awesome mystery underpinning everything that exists. This is one of my favourite photos from the Hubble telescope. This is trillions and trillions of miles across. There are young stars just leaving the nursery. Where is God? You know, when, when I was a boy, God was watching this. God was clicking the hands, you know, watch me do this. Huh? No, no, no. This is unfolding in the mystery of God. Whatever this mystery is. Andromeda, our closest galaxy. Billions and billions of stars. Where is this reality? It's everywhere. Planet Earth, for four and a half billion years, this presence has been here. The wonder of this planet is that here, in a speck of dust in the cosmos, just the right distance from a star, just the right gravitational fields, meteorites and asteroids and now they're saying water probably came from within but anyway but here where the conditions are right that this reality that is everywhere can come to expression on this planet in a way it can no longer do on Mars or Venus or Jupiter wow what, what, what a place 
What a, and, and, and we just take it for granted. So some ground on which I stand anyway as I try to make this enormous shift in my thinking because like most of us I'm being turned right upside down. No, there's not a God out there the way the Hebrew people thought of God. There's not a God up there the way Paul thought of God and Jesus going up into the heavens to become the Christ to judge the living and the dead. It's over. I'm sorry, but it's over. It's finished. G-O-D is bigger than that. Come to grips with it. I learned in a Catholic seminary. I was ordained 50 years ago last Friday, by the way. I've come a long way since then. (laughs) But I learned in the Catholic seminary that God is beyond human notions of a deity listening, speaking, thinking and intervening. That God is bigger than that. You know, don't lock God into our human concepts. But it's precisely what we've done and precisely what needs changing. That this word God, if we want to keep using it, points to a mystery beyond our human images and concepts. Otherwise, it's just a sort of a a superhuman. I learned in the seminary that God is the source, the sustainer of all. Yes, I can still hold that, but let it be everywhere now. Not a watchman in the sky, not an overseer in the sky anymore, pulling strings. Let me, let me now, using a pink overlay, come to a realisation that I never had 20 years ago even, that this mystery comes to expression in and through what is there. That is true of Venus, it's true of Mars, it's true of this planet, and it's true of each one of us. And I'll come back to that in the second half of the talk. This mystery comes to expression in and through What is there? Or another way of saying that for us is how we allow it to come to expression in us. But see, while we're saying that, and I need a drink of water, so excuse me for a moment. We've always had this thinking in the Christian tradition, the Muslim tradition, and the Jewish tradition. We've always had this thinking. The mystics had it. But our theologians keep getting locked into the notion of disconnection and the Christology. And Here's Augustine, God above whom there's nothing, outside of whom nothing exists, without whom there is nothing. Well, that's fine, Augustine. But then you turn the pages and Augustine says, every baby born on this planet is born into a state of total separation from God. I mean, talk about institutional theology ruling your mind and screwing it up. There it goes. And great for the institution, isn't it, to tell the world that the only way you're going to have the life of God in you is if we come and pour water over you, or if you come into our church. Otherwise, there is no salvation. But see, if, if G-O-D really points to this universal reality that is truly everywhere, truly the source, the sustainer of everything that exists, and if everything does depend on this reality for its very existence, then no one and nothing can ever be disconnected from this mystery. You can say in your head you are, of course you can. And if that's true, and I believe it's true, then let's stop telling stories about humanity disconnected from God. And let's let's bring into, into our focus 
what the mystics have been saying for thousands and thousands of years. So here's Gregory of Nyssa. And what's interesting here, it's in the 4th century. So the theologians are in Nicaea arguing, who is Jesus that Jesus and Jesus alone can get us into heaven because God has locked us out? And here's another voice in the church saying, when one considers the universe, can you be so simple-minded as not to believe that the divine is present in everything, pervading, embracing and penetrating it? We wonder why the mystics got drowned out in our church, huh? And why the theologians, well, we, you know, correct thinking about theology, ruled Christianity, it still does in many places. So what I bring out of all that, that I exist, I live in a universe that is bathed in the great mystery, whatever name you want to call G-O-D today, and names are hard by creative mystery, creative wonder, energizing, whatever name you give to it. But I live in a universe that is totally pervaded, penetrated by this presence. I will not do any theology anymore with any sense at all that God is somewhere else. I will not pray anymore with that sense. I'll have nothing to do with that theology anymore. And I suspect that generations coming after us, and including us as well, of course, that's where it, they will be. It's time to stop telling stories about humanity being disconnected. And that's why in 1998, when I had published Tomorrow's Catholic, Understanding God and Jesus in a New Millennium, and a new archbishop came into the Melbourne Archdiocese and I was silenced on the spot and the book was banned and I had to resign from priesthood at the end of the year. Because that is unacceptable. Because, hey, this is what the institution is about. We're to get you to heaven. You can't question that and be a Christian. Can't you? Oh, yes, you can. Just wait till the second half of this talk. And this part's about to finish. See, many people, and myself included for many years, we were sort of conflicted. You know, we want to move away from a sense that, you know, God is a male God in the heavens, you know, we, we don't believe that anymore, you know, and God is everywhere and da-da-da-da-da-da. Okay. But I say to, to most progressive Christian groups around the world, let me hear the way you pray. And I'll come back to this in the second half of the talk. And my experience is that most progressive Christian groups still frame their prayer as if they're praying to a listening deity. Examine it. I will come back to that. Let's, yeah, that's okay. This is the one that really grabs us. That is the smite button. And this is the image of God that is carried by so many Christians still today. Why did God allow my wife to die? Why did God allow my baby to be run over by a car? Why does God do this? Why does God do that? It's the biblical notion of the almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful and all-loving God who lives in the heavens and pulls strings. Is that what we want to live with? Come back? No. What we're going to do now is we're going to stand and have a stretch for about one minute. Don't make a toilet break or you'll miss the start of the second thing. This is just a stretch, okay? Just a stretch. Okay, don't go away, don't go out. We'll call you out. I showed the photo of the Hubble telescope taking the 10,000 galaxies. This is another photo that I also think will shape the future of theology 
and our question, who are we in relationship with the great mystery? It's a photo taken after a giant supernova has exploded in a galaxy. And something like this happened in our galaxy four and a half billion years ago. And when the star exploded, the elements on the period periodic table higher than iron, they, they need a huge explosion to create them. And they're created in this explosion. So in this explosion, it sends out the remnants of the star. So this is a cloud of gas and dust that, that spreads out for trillions and trillions of miles. And then what happens eventually is gravity comes into play and it is condensed, 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 and doom, a new star appears. So the scientists tell us that four and a half billion years ago in this galaxy, something like that happened, and the new star that appeared, there it is out there, still shining tonight, huh? Our sun and the leftovers. Every atom in our body today, thank you, every atom in our body today was in that cloud. That's the scientific reality. That's the scientific story today. Every atom in our body has been on a cosmic journey for four and a half billion years and gone from there to where we are today. Transformation after transformation. The earth and everything on the earth, four and a half billion years. You wouldn't want to be here on earth two and a half billion years ago. But again, transformation after transformation after transformation, then life comes and off it goes. And the scientists tell us there's a pattern of gathering together, of cooperation. Darwin wasn't just about survival of the fittest, he was also about cooperation. And particles get together with particles and form atoms, and atoms get together, form complex atoms, and then molecules, and complex molecules form DNA, and DNA get together, living organisms, living organisms get together, and out of this, human consciousness arises. A patterns of cooperation. And just as an aside to that, the human species is the only life form that we know that can say, we will not do it. We will not cooperate. We will not work together. Hey? And so the, the scientists look at this and they talk about mind, consciousness. They're not talking about conscious awareness, but mind, consciousness, a, a principle of self-organisation, self-maintenance, intentionality. That's all through the universe. What's the best example I know of that? It's my body. 60 trillion cells in my body are doing that. And you know what? Not one of them is thinking about it. When I was an embryo in my mother's womb, some cells knew how to go and form my heart, my eyes. Were they thinking about it? No. Which sort of should give us a little bit of a pause because we tend to think that, you know, human consciousness, human awareness is the greatest thing in the universe. The cells in my body would laugh at us and say, hey, Moorwood, you try doing what we do. Huh? <laughs> you wouldn't even know next day what went with what. Okay. So we go from that four and a half billion years. And what do we do? We don't blink. Because we're not steeped in the story. Our religion has not steeped us in the story. Our education in the past has not steeped us in the story. One, because we never had the story when I was a boy. Here is wonder, here is awe, here is... Where, where else? Where else in the universe does this happen? Four and a half billion years to a cloud of dust to a butterfly. And it's all around us. And we don't even think about it. We just take it for granted. So the heart, I want to say that the heart of reshaping religious thought and imagination, the heart of it is a sense of wonder. It's a sense of awe. 
Because now, as a person of faith, as a person who still wants to hold on to G-O-D pointing to something, not a God, not a figure in the sky anymore, but to some awesome reality in which everything exists. Here's the, this is the, 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 the great scientific story. But I'm a person of faith. And a child has every right to say to me, well, you know, is, is G-O-D there? Where, where do you put G-O-D here? And I say simply, you put it there. And it's unfolding in this mystery. And then you go from this to this. Now, I, I don't know about you. I, I, I'm moved almost to tears whenever I see that. And, and I mean that. I'm moved to tears. Where else in the universe is a life form that gives this awesome reality a way of expressing itself in human form. Where? Wow. And now I bring my faith to this story and it's not just a child. It is the human expression of whatever it is that grounds the universe. And this is, wow, what a story. What are we? What is it to be human? I, I have one lifetime of how many years to be the human expression of whatever it is that underpins the universe. Wow. Don't waste it, Michael. Don't waste it. In Australia, we went to the Aboriginal people, like the church went all around the world and said, no, God's not near you. The only way you can get to God is you come into our church and we baptise you. We become a Christian and then you'll have the life of God. And now we say, thank you, Michael, but we've got God. And we've always had the sense of the divine in the land and in our rivers and in our dream time. And you've been in your head, you Christian missionaries, eh? and trying to destroy our culture. And more than 3,000 years ago, someone said or wrote, Beyond all conception, the one light shines forth. It is the great. It is smaller than the smallest, further than the furthest, nearer than the nearest. And the wise know it resting within. The eyes cannot see it. And speech cannot describe it. Whoops. Nor any sense perceive it. It's not attained by effort nor through any austerities, but only when meditation has purified the mind can you know the one beyond all divisions. Mandaka, Upanishads, a thousand years before Jesus. We live in a universe bathed in this mystery. So now very quickly, how then would I understand Revelation? I'm not going to throw out the Bible. I'm not going to throw out the Hebrew Scriptures. But Revelation now is not a God in the heaven breaking forth to one people. Re Revelation doesn't come from the heavens anymore. Revelation comes from the ground up. And so here, if this is geographically, here Amos and Hosea, and Ruth and Naomi, Ezekiel, Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord God was in them. And they heard a voice within them. They were able to say, in their culture, in their worldview, this is what the Lord God wants. Justice and peace and compassion. This is not a voice from heaven. 
This is a voice from deep within the human. And at the same time, as Isaiah is speaking, you had the Buddha and Confucius and Zoroaster, the native people here, the First Nation people in Canada, the Australian Aboriginal people. If only, we, if only we'd had this message 2,000 years ago, we would not have gone you know, to other cultures and said, you know, God is not near you. No, it's here. Revelation is from the ground up. Jesus. Well, who now is Jesus? In my thinking anyway. See, I don't believe in a God who locked us out of heaven anymore. The Council of Nicaea is the answer to a question I'm not asking anymore. How does Jesus, how, you know, only Jesus get into heaven to save us? Because I don't believe in a God who locked us out anymore. So who is Jesus? Let's take Jesus out of that first century worldview and imagination. I, my responsibility today as a 21st century person is to make sense of Jesus in my worldview. Not in a worldview that was full of you know, messiahs and drop downs from heaven and astrologers and God was up there. Jesus comes from the divine creative presence at work in the universe. He's the human expression. I can go to Jesus and say, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Yes. They're the words he used. I know the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Yes, yes. That's what it's about. He knew that. Jesus in no way, in no shape or form, was Jesus concerned about getting people to heaven. He did not believe in a God who locked people out. He did not believe in a God withholding punishment. I mean, withholding forgiveness. Let's go back into the Gospels now with a lens that's different to Paul of Tarsus. Because for Paul, it was all about getting into heaven so he could tell the Greeks that Jesus could get us to heaven. Now, let me go back now and let me go to the Gospels and let me see Jesus full of the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. I'm sent to preach to the poor, the downtrodden, to set people free. Jesus is like the writer of the Upanishads. Jesus gets it. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And he looks at his society and it's ruled by violence, by greed. He looks around his people. This is, we are God's people. And what does he see? People without a shepherd, people burdened, people thinking God is nowhere near them, people downtrodden with no hope. And the question for Jesus of Nazareth is, how come you don't see what I see? What's stopping, what's stopping the spirit of the Lord God rising in you as I experience it in me? So Jesus gets out of bed every day, not to get people to heaven, but to change society. It's simple. He called it the kingdom of God. We have to create a society that runs on compassion and nonviolence and justice and care for the poor so that no one in our community suffers at the hands of everyone else. Who's going to create that society? The Romans are not going to do it. The temple priesthood is not going to do it. So do you want to do it? Well, you're not asking us, are you, Jesus? which is the perfect answer. Why? Because they have a sense of a God who pulls strings. If I've got leprosy or a withered arm, then God is punishing me for sin. God can't be near us. We're no good. 
We're fearful of God. So the task for Jesus is, how do I change your imagination? That's the whole point of Jesus. Convert. He's not railing at people and saying, change your life, stop your sinning or you won't get to heaven. No, he's saying, convert, change what you believe that you may believe the good news. What's the good news? The kingdom of God is here. The same spirit that's in me is in you. Why, why can't you see it? So he talks in parables. You are to walk with your God. Now, he's a first century Jew. Of course he thought of God in heaven. But you are to be in relationship with your God like a child in the arms of the most loving parent. You wouldn't let the baby die or drop. You walk around as if God is pulling strings and you're asking, well, mm -hmm. get rid of it. Convert, change. Go home and think about the parables. You love your wife, do you? Oh, yeah. If your children ask you for a sandwich, would you give them a stone? Of course we wouldn't. Well, go home and think about this, that when you do these things, this is the spirit of the Lord God in you. And if you live in love, then God lives in you. And you live in this mystery. Jesus, Jesus, it's not that all the divine is in me and it's not in you. See, that, that's the story we've had for 2,000 years, huh? Because only then could he get us to heaven. No, no, no. Let us break through that and let us go now to the Gospels in an understanding of, oh, now I see. Now I see what he is ready to die for. It's not because I'm a poor wretch in my sins and only Jesus can get me to heaven. He's dying for the sake of humanity. He wants a better human society. And the only people who can do it, here we are, folks. But we're not going to do it if we walk around fearful of God, thinking that we are poor wretches and God is not near us and God can't be trusted. The message of Jesus is, are you hearing me? Are you, you know what I'm ready to die for? Have you got it? The great tragedy of the Christian religion is that within 30 years of Jesus dying, his message was changed completely. And we get a whole message, no, it's all about the Christ who goes up into heaven to be the judge of the living and the dead, and to send the Spirit of God upon us. Excuse me? Jesus says the Spirit's here. What's this story about? I've got to go up and get the Spirit to come down. Again, I am saying in five minutes what it would take a whole day to do. Huh? To go into the Gospels, to go into the story of Jesus, to go into the story of the early, of the early Jews following Jesus, to go into the first century to go and look at what happened, how the Jesus story got distorted, and then you get to Nicaea 300 years later, and it's all about, see, it's a story about disconnection from God. It's institutional story. No, there's a better story. We have the story. It's a better story, and it's more faithful to Jesus. And prayer? So what's prayer about now? I don't believe God is up there anymore. I don't think worship, I don't think we gather on Sundays for God's sake. Whatever, whatever this overlay points to, it doesn't, need my, it doesn't need my worship. Excuse me, but it doesn't. Huh? Do I need to gather with a community of people? Do I need to gather as a, someone who follows Jesus to hear his story? Do I need to be affirmed as a follower of Jesus? Yes, the same spirit's in me. Do I need to be challenged? Do I need to be ritualized? And I stand up in the face of this community 
and I say, I give you my word, the story of Jesus will live on in my life, I give you my word, I ritualise that. Of course I need to do that. In other words, prayer is for our sake. Liturgy, worship, we gather for our sake. I don't think there's a God out there who hears my prayer. Now, I could tell you a story, but I haven't got time to tell you the story, huh? But this long story. Since 2004, I have stopped addressing vocal prayers to God. It was the hardest thing I've ever tried to do. Well, let me briefly tell you the story, huh? I was actually in um, Missouri and uh, a group of people had asked me to, to write a, a sort of a Sunday liturgy and, and I, I had never done this before. And so they showed me where the typewriter was, or no, where the computer was and I sit at the computer and I start writing. Now if somebody said to you, would you write Sunday's liturgy and the prayers, well, where would you start? Don't answer. So. So I sit at the computer and I write, create a God. And the insight, the dawning was like, it's almost like I heard a voice say, yes, Michael, what's next? <laughs> and it struck me, what am I writing this prayer for? You know, is it, is it for God's sake? Is God listening? And I thought, no, 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 no. I, I, I don't believe in that God anymore, that concept of God. So who am I writing this prayer for? And so I learned, no, this is for our sake. So after that, I started to change my vocal prayer and I tried to stop addressing prayer to God. Subsequently, wrote a book called Praying a New Story. None of the prayers are addressed to a listening God. What I did was try and change the emphasis. For example, we could have prayed here tonight at the beginning of, of our gathering, and the prayer could have been, oh God, send your spirit upon us. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And I'd say to people, stop doing that. The spirit's already here. As we gather here tonight, let us call to mind that each and every one of us are bearers of that infinite creative spirit at work in the universe for generations, and off you go. Huh? It really caught me, uh, the practice was, you know, people would say to me, Michael, would you say grace? You know, bless us the Lord, da, 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 go, we give you thanks. No, no, Michael, stop, stop praying to God. As we gather here tonight, let us be mindful of the spirit of goodness and gratitude and abundance in our lives, in our families. And in other words, the word that came to mind was to affirm the presence here and then pray out of that, pray out of that. Whenever I talk to progressive groups here in Australia, Canada, I sort of put the charge on them. Please try it. Please try it. Otherwise, our prayer keeps us locked into the notion that it's all about an external God listening to us. And if we are really trying to move into this great shift of changing religious thought and imagination, and somehow our vocal prayer should reflect that. It's a big challenge and it's difficult, but you could try it. So prayer, prayer, my, and then personal prayer. Per, my personal prayer these days, you know, I can go for a walk and have a sense of, you know, I can look at a bird, a flower. And it, it, it's more sort of reflection, contemplation, four and a half billion years in the making, but I can stand here and I'm conscious, I'm, I'm consciously aware, I can tell the story. And then this sense of, of, of me being four and a half billion years in the making, and what am I doing with it? Even if I'm sick or ill or whatever. Folks, that's where I end because where we start with is a sense of a package. If you're like me, we all got the package, huh? This is the package that defined what it means to be a Christian or to be faithful to the church. 
what we're finding today is many, many young people no longer believe it. We're finding today that many of our own peers don't believe it. I don't believe it anymore. The biggest tragedy in the Christian church today, I think, is adults. And I think it's mainly in the 50, 60, 70 group. Huh? This is my experience. Who are walking away. I mean, the young just don't go in the first place. Huh? But they're walking away because it's no longer nourishing what they're thinking. And the greatest tragedy in the church is that they're not picked up into another story. We have another story here about God, about Jesus, about prayer, about revelation, and about ourselves. And the most important thing about this story is that it's not just for us Christians. The first time in human history we have a story of our human origins from out there. This story is universal. It's the first time in history that we have the opportunity to shape a faith story that's inclusive of all peoples. Even though we may go at it a Christian way, a Jewish way, a Muslim way, or a humanist way, or some people say, well, I'm not interested in religion at all. But at least we have a story now that is about, wow, what it is to be human. And that's it, folks. So um, I would encourage you uh, to get one of the pieces of paper, or Holly's got them up here if you have a question. We're going to take a 15-minute break. And uh, I don't know if there's still refreshments out there or not. Are there? There are. And so go have something, 15 minutes, at 8.15, we'll be back in here and do a Q&A. First of all, I want to express my gratitude for your being here. Thank you. Thank you. And I um, want to brag about my intuition. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was spot on. So, I believe, as you do, that we are immersed in this sacred mystery. Your favorite phrase is divine presence, right? Yeah, it changes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's all right. So, yeah. And, and, and that our responsibility is to allow this divine presence to find expression through how we live, mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. expressing um, not disunity, but association and connection and love and all of that. So, how do you explain our current? Uh, I don't know how things You're are. You're not going to say current president, surely. Huh? Yeah. Our what? Yeah. Our what? <laughs> Our current president. Uh, no. no. How do you, how, but how do, how do you understand the, um, the divisiveness, the hatred, the rise of things like white nationalism and so forth, um, these people are also part of the divine mystery. Mm -hmm. So what's gone wrong and what can we do about it? I, I would keep coming back to that phrase that I used there, that this mystery works in and through what it has to work with. That that's true of the universe, it's true of Mars, that the divine creative presence... If I go back 30 years and I used to say to groups, you know, God cannot um, create pine trees on Mars. And some fundamentalist Christians would look at me and <laughs> like, God can do anything if God wanted to click God's hands and say, no, 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 no. This creative, energizing presence works in and through what it has to work with. 
Okay. Now, the question you ask, I think, has to do with the human community, the way we're socialised, the way we're brought up, the way we're educated, the influences of family, environment, and, and all that. And this creative presence works in and through what it has to work with. So you can take two children side by side, and when they start, the same divine creative energising presence is there. In one child, that presence may be nurtured into love and compassion and generosity, and the other one, the child may be beaten, abused, uh, and, 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 and so on. In other words, the divine creative energising presence does not get the chance. Why? Because we humans get in the way of it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I, I think the principle stands. You know, people say to me, well, what about evil? How do you explain evil? I say, it's exactly the same principle. Only humans can do evil. And it, it's all to do with allowing this presence to work in amongst us. What I like about that is that if, if we could only sort of come to own that evil is our responsibility. So it's our responsibility to do something about it. And if we don't do something about it, and I go back to Jesus, that's what I think he was on about. Only if we get a better image of ourselves, a better understanding of ourselves, and an understanding of this power, presence within us, then we can change. But if someone grows up without that, then he or she is going to draw back from that. It will be limited. Yeah, it's there, but it's limited. But so it's always there, it's always there. In, in my own study of, of trying to understand mysticism and, and particularly delving into Sufi mysticism, <clears throat> one of the writers that I read said, the universe operates perfectly. And you find that perfection in both excrement and an emerald. Mm -hmm. It's in both places. And um, then I got interested in, in the big story and Brian Swim and thanks to Holly and things like that. And I found out that the, the cosmos has a lot of tragedy in it. Mm -hmm. Of course. You know, galaxies gobble up galaxies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of tragedy among the human scene too. Mm -hmm. Now, we humans, being slightly narcissistic, sometimes, <laughs> think that we could be the end of the evolutionary change. This is, uh, this, this is the apex. It ain't going to get any better than this. But we're just on the front edge of what could come. Oh, I, 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 I think there's an amazing sense of human arrogance. Yeah. We're, it is. I mean, it, it's like, here we are on this planet, and this creative presence works in the human species for as long as it can. But who knows, 200 years time, an asteroid might hit this planet. Humanity gets wiped out. The rest of the universe will not even blink. It will not blink, okay? The divine creative presence, whatever name you put on that, will not blink, okay? But uh, so this sense that you know, the universe is somehow geared, uh, that the, the human is, is at the peak. No, all I can say is that here on this planet, here on this planet, we're a life form that uh, we can be consciously aware of the goodness that we carry. But that goodness is all around us. It's in the cats, it's in the dogs, it's in the birds, it's in the flowers, it's, it's everywhere. We just happen to be conscious of it. And the fact that we are conscious of it gives us a greater responsibility to care for the environment that can nurture this. So do you have an approach as somebody who focuses on adult faith development about how we can assist children in growing into this kind of progressive view? Now, I didn't ask you to ask that question, did I? No. <laughs> I just happened to have a book <laughs> and the title of the book is Children Praying a New Story. Mm, how to sit with children at night, at the end of the day. What, what, what sort of prayer would you pray? Uh, how would you talk about Jesus? How would you talk about, if you go in, in the Catholic cycle, how would you go through you know, the, the, the sacraments, for example? But, but, but prayer, what sort of prayers would you say in school? Um, so... Here's an easy answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's, I mean, to, to give an example, okay, I, I think one of the one of the uh, things is, or one of the realities is, 
like if you take, uh, say, people in their 30s and 40s, with a, four, uh, a three year old, a lot of 30 and 40 year old people have stopped going to church. Okay? So, how do they teach their child who wants to pray at night? You know, and they still have a sense. But what they would do is go back into what they learned. So, God bless mummy and daddy, God thank you, da 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 da. da. And, and well, you don't have to even be a non church goer. Church goers are in the same situation. How do, I play, how do I pray with my little child? If I were a parent and I had a two or three year old, four year old child, at the end of the day, I would say, I would talk with the child about what happened today. I would talk with the child about what happened today, who was good, anyone, you know, what were you glad to see, what helped you, da 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 da, what would you give thanks for? And at the end of the day, I'd say, let's give thanks that this earth is so richly blessed by, now if you want to use God language, God language by, a goodness all around us. I, I would keep naming it. I keep naming it. I think the important thing, and I would go back to Jesus with this, I think the important thing is to keep naming our everyday experience as somehow creative, somehow blessed, if you want to call it sacred or, or, or whatever. But I, I would not teach my child prayers, oh God bless mummy and daddy. Um, I would... Uh, I'd be wanting to affirm this presence in him or her every time. Mm -hmm. It's scary enough for some adults. To it's very scary for adults. Yeah. Make this change. Oh, yes, it's very scary. It's very, very difficult to do because the only prayer form that most of us grew up with, and it's so deeply ingrained in us, it's, it's like it just comes out, doesn't it? Oh God, you know, God bless us. God bless mummy and daddy. Oh God, thank you for the day. Now in a sense, there's nothing wrong with it. Of course there's nothing wrong with it. Oh God, I'm so sick of trying. Well, that's okay because it's giving expression to something deep within me. Put it out there. It doesn't matter. God's not hearing it. But, okay. <laughs> so, you know. So. I you mean, know, I, I read your book in memory of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And somebody's asked a question about having a personal relationship with Jesus. And that book is very much about a personal relationship with Jesus. Of course, of course. Imaginatively. I, I, I belong to a Roman Catholic uh, order of, of priests and brothers. was called Missionaries of the Sacred Heart. And part of, our, part of my background um, in my training was to have a, a deep sense of the human reality of Jesus that, uh, yes, he was God, but human. And trying to go to the Gospels to see Jesus as someone human like us. So what was the question again? I'm, uh, you I, have a personal relationship I get carried Jesus. away from this. Okay, okay. So let, let me give you an example. If I take the, the scene in, in, John's gospel, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, and Jesus hears the, the death of John the Baptist. He's been murdered. And I ask people, and I've done this so many times, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times uh, with Christians, say, if you were imaginatively sitting with Jesus and you imagine that scene, what might Jesus be feeling or thinking? And literally, I, I could fill a, a blackboard with people saying, well, he's distressed, he's angry, he feels alone, he's, you know, on and on and on, he feels powerless. And then in Matthew's Gospel, he goes up to the mountain. And in the seminary, I, I heard that he had the beatific vision. It was like a laser beam to God. And I think, well, boy, for you, Jesus. Huh? <laughs> if, if that's true, you're nothing like me. You're nothing like me. You're, you know, he's supposed to be a companion for me in ministry. So now I think that when Jesus went to the mountain, that Jesus really had to struggle with what had just happened here? And if I come from down from this mountain and I go that way, they'll knock my head off because I'm next or they'll put me in jail. So maybe I could come down from the mountain and just go back to Nazareth and forget all this stuff because obviously the people are not converting these guys I'm with. They don't even get it. So the question is, could Jesus that night on the mountain have decided I'm out of here? But then you go into your Christian theology 
and all Christian theology said, oh no, 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 Jesus was the second person of the Trinity and he was ruled by the mind of God that overshadowed his human nature. Well, this is true, I'm quoting here. Uh -huh. So he's like a robot, it's like winding him up. And it's like, for me, here, here I am a Catholic priest, I'm trying to do my work, I feel powerless at times, I feel distressed, I feel lonely at times, I feel angry as hell that I'll never see the church that I want to see. And you tell me Jesus has no sense of what's going on in my heart? So as someone in ministry, I want to know that this person at the heart of my life knows what it's like to walk in my shoes. So in other words, friendship is like, you, know, you don't become friends with someone if you don't sit with them and talk with them and get inside their skin. Okay. So where am I going with all this? My friendship with Jesus. It's imaginative. It's imaginative. But it's the only way that I can, I can break out of having Jesus as a theological construct who breezes through life because he knows the Father's will, he's going to die on the cross for my sins. Well, bully for you, Jesus. But you don't know what it's like to walk in my shoes? Oh. So I felt it's very important in ministry that we want to minister, but not only in ministry, in life. Does Jesus know what it's like to lose someone? Does Jesus know what it's like to be afraid? Does he know what it's like to feel powerless? Does he know what it's like to have his friends desert him? Does he know what it's like to be alone? Does he know what it's like to say, where the hell is God in this? Now, I wrote about that and I got condemned by Rome. By Rome, in, in the first book I wrote. Because Rome... Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith said, oh, no, 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 Maud's a heretic because Jesus had the to be powerless. He didn't know what it was like to be afraid. I said, well, you, you just took Jesus out of the human reality. So, yes, I'm, I'm all for friendship with Jesus. Imaginative, but yes, but it's very, very important to me. One of the most important books I've read recently about this is a book by a guy named Bruce Chilton called Rabbi Jesus, an Intimate Biography. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've read that book. Uh, Bruce Chilton is a member of the Jesus Seminar, and he's written a book about Jesus very much like what you talk <coughs> about, about when Jesus left home, what it was like for him, and cool. his uh, tutelage under John the Baptist, and the struggles that he had, I found it to be really liberating yeah. and um, energizing. Some people, it just scares the daylights out of them because they are feel, they feel like they're betraying the church or betray or putting their eternal soul at risk. You know. True. I, I think one of the tragedies of, of of Christianity, especially with people who are suffering. What the Christian church should have been doing for thousands of years and what it should be doing today is that when people suffer loss, grief, you know, a, a real tragedy, it's almost like instinctively they should be able to go to this person who is at the heart of their faith with an understanding that he knows what it's like to walk in my shoes. But no, the, the, the Christian church hasn't done that. Well, he was God. He wouldn't know what it's like, would he? You know, to be afraid, to feel broken-hearted to feel rejected. Yeah, well, let's do a meditation on the night before he died and we can go through some of that. But we don't do that. We do, we do the theology. He washed feet. He instituted the Eucharist. You know, it's like, here's the Son of God doing all these great things. And we keep missing the whole point that Jesus, when he went to his death, was heartbroken. He died on the cross, a broken man. He's not hanging there, well, I'm the Son of God, three days, I'm out of here. No, <laughs> truly, truly, he, he's, 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 hard, he's broken, he's broken. Do you know what it's like to hang on in faith and you don't know what, what, what the future is? And uh, Excuse me, wind me up. What right, what right do we have to say to Jesus of Nazareth, you would not know what it's like to walk in my shoes? This is what Good Friday is about. He's not dying for my sins. He's saying to me, will you walk in my faith when life pulls you apart? That's, that's the question, huh? That's the issue. That's why we pick up the cross and say, yes, I'll do it. 
Gee, that, that's, that's a task. So those of us who are still in middle management, <laughs> um, <laughs> I've given you a word, huh? Uh, Lord, <laughs> and, and you know, there was a study done not long ago about why people go to church. And um, this sociologist came up with 27 distinctly different reasons that people immerse themselves in a community mm -hmm. for all sorts of reasons. And we contribute to the problem by every Sunday we have readings from the lectionary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. After which we say the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And everybody says, thanks be to God. Now, some of us have learned to kind of uh, translate that, or in a way, some of us have not. What do you, I, and I can understand, I've, I've spent years and years and years studying Jesus and um, what did Jesus more likely say and who is Jesus and, and all of that, but we've not given attention to some of Paul's writings like this. And Paul's a troublemaker for us. What do you think? It's time that we recognize that Paul was a first century Jew trying to make sense of Jesus in the first century in the background of the whole Jewish Messianic age and also in light of meeting the Greek world and trying to bridge the gap between the two. It's time to say that Paul was an ordinary theologian trying to make sense. He is no more the word of God than you are. And it's time to bring Paul down from his pedestal. It's time to stop this proof texting that because Paul said it, it's absolute truth. Who, who decided, who decided, who decided that, that Paul is the last word on God, the institution. Why? Because Paul's theology gives correct institutional identity. So, so you know, Paul's the last word. No, he's not. There's a lot in Paul's writings that, that we can like. Uh, we don't have to throw it all out. But, but, but Paul's a first century Jew trying to make sense of Jesus in the first century worldview. So, and his Christology uh, needs to be examined and, uh, well, you can do what you like with it once you examine it, but I, <laughs> I, I know, no, true, I, I've, no, no, Paul, Paul's, Paul's Christology, I, I, I think, really, it, it's part of this whole struggle of reshaping Christian. See, the church became known as Christianity, Christianity became the religion of the Christ. That's not what this is about. So you've got two understandings of Christ. The Hebrew understanding of Christ and the one that applies to Jesus in the Gospel is from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, I am anointed. Christos. And translate the word Christ, it means anointed. Jesus anointed. And if you look at Jesus preaching the kingdom of God, then what would Jesus have felt that he was anointed for? He wasn't actually anointed, but huh? what he felt that the Spirit of the Lord God was calling him to do, to preach to the poor, to set prisoners free, to open eyes, all, all that. That's Christos. But when you get to Paul, now you have Jesus is taken into heaven. In heaven, he is anointed. He becomes Christos. What for? to become the judge of the living and the dead in 1 Thessalonians. That doesn't happen, so now Christos becomes understanding that he is anointed to get the Spirit to come down upon us. And well, hang on, Paul, the Spirit was here. Jesus was telling people that. Well, Jesus anointed to heaven to win for us forgiveness of God. Well, hang on, Jesus never preached that God wasn't forgiving. Or well, he's anointed in heaven that we would become sons and daughters of God. Well, hang on, Paul. I hear Jesus saying, if you are a peacemaker, you are a child of God. So what's this Christos that, in other words, Christ now becomes the heavenly reality. And now what happens in the followers of Paul's Christ religion is it's all about the Savior now. He's the Savior who gets us into heaven. 
no, no, the Jesus story is not about, and the Christos, the, the anointing is not about getting to heaven. It, it, it's about, it's about baptism. It's about anointing. Why are we baptized? To get to heaven? Well, that's one understanding, but the other one is, no, we're under baptized, anointed to do what Jesus did. So the fundamental understanding of Christos is preach, open eyes, go to the poor, set the prisoners free. That's Christos. But anyway, one minute. So there's a story I'll share with, with you all about Rabia, uh, told by Rabia about this angel who is um, walking down the road and the angel has a torch of flame in one hand and a big bucket of water in the other and uh, is asked by Jesus, where are you going? And uh, the angel says, with the torch, I'm going to burn down the mansions of heaven. And with the water, I'm going to put out the fires of hell. And then we'll see who loves God just for God. <laughs> okay. So it's not about going to heaven when you die. No way, no way. You're not going. It's not about heaven. No, no. So um, talk to us a little bit about, uh, I've heard it said some in this space, and I'm assuming that because your focus is on faith development, that you would teach about daily spiritual practice. I teach about that. <laughs> I rant about that. You know, I, I, seriously, I think that um, my definition currently of what it means to be a Christian is to um, have a relationship with the God of Jesus, with the trust that that relationship will not leave me unchanged. And I can't have that relationship if I don't have some way of daily practicing that relationship and grow in knowledge and all of all of that. So please don't undercut my teaching about having a daily spiritual practice. <laughs> but <laughs> how do we nurture our faith development on a regular basis? How do you teach people about that? Oh, I, well, I, I find that difficult because <clears throat> um, I, I guess my seminary years. Uh, have have led me to a bias against a daily practice because I think so often it comes back to particular personalities, particular interests. Some people's spirituality is based on nature. Other people, it's uh, uh, in the head. Uh, you know, their, their thoughts and what they think are the important basis of, of their religious uh, faith. Uh, and, you know, I, I found myself, I'm, my own temperament, uh, I found it extremely difficult to sit for half an hour you know, in, in contemplation and you know, I would have spent 50, 60 years of my life in, in that. And I, so, and I think it changes. I, I, I could not, uh, I, I guess I could help people lead into meditation practices, uh, but the same practices might be practices that would drive me up the wall. Um, but I... Um, put it this way, that I, in the, in the 70s and 80s, I, I worked full time in, in a retreat house in spiritual direction. And our, our main, the, the main work that came out of prayer, the, the main word that I would put on it is awareness, is awareness, okay? And that the purpose of my personal prayer is to deepen my awareness of this creative presence within me and around me and in you. Okay, So that's my task in prayer. My task in prayer is not so much to pray to God. You talked about a relationship with God. And I'd say I don't have a relationship with God. I don't use that language anymore. But to me, it's, it's, it's more awareness that this mystery is here in me. So it's, it's like a responsibility. It's, it's, yeah, I'm struggling for words, but that, that awareness. Well, let me put it this way. If I go back again, say, into the 70s, when I was in the old paradigm, 
what became important for me was the notion that my God loved Michael personally. And I had a very, very rich prayer experience in the mid 70s of that that really rocked me. I mean, it was just absolutely fabulous. So I'm in the old paradigm, the God of the Bible loved Michael Moorwood unconditionally. Because that's the only way that this awesome reality could break through to me was the window that I was using at the time. My window was the God Yahweh in heaven. Okay. Here I am 40 years later. That's not my window. God, the personal God out there is not my window to this mystery. My window to this mystery is somehow, well, it, basically it's the pink sheet. Huh? It's the pink overlay. And that here I am today and what I'm trying to do is come to a sense of the awesome wonder and appreciation of what it is to be human. So I go back 40 years or 30 years and I speak the language of love and relationship with God. Now today I'm not talking the language of relationship but of this presence coming to you know, human expression in me. If I go back here, the relationship, it expanded my mind. My heart, wow, God loves me. huh? It expanded my mind, my heart, my desire to be generous because that's what love does. And that's what a good relationship does. Now, when I'm here, I don't talk that language. I'm not relating with a personal God like that. But now, what about my heart? My heart is expanded. It's like, wow, this is what I am. This is what I'm called to do. This is who Jesus is. This is what I'm... So the experience is not different. That's the thing. And I can't ask someone to go from there to here. That's not my task, okay? And I say to someone, if that's where you are with the personal God, I'm not telling you to move. Whatever window works for you at the moment, you use it and let it go and, and work from that. So this way, this way is not better than this way. It's just simply where I am at the moment. And I guess that's, that's like the meditative process when you're asking, you know, uh, teaching people to pray. Um, yeah, pray, pray the, what works best, but always with an eye open that maybe change may come if my thinking changes. But don't be afraid of change. Yeah. So I, I have frequently said that the most successful piece of bad theology ever written <laughs> was about atonement theology. Oh, of course. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, of course. And yet, and yet, so many people hear that and they will say, and I bet you get this question a lot, you mean there's no heaven? I'm not going to heaven when I die? How do you deal with that one? Almost every weekend that I run, I run a session on uh, what do you imagine is going to happen when you die? Okay. It's the most vibrant, open, wonderful discussions you know, ever uh, on, 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 on weekends. And the interesting part about it is that very few people talk about that they're going up to heaven. Nowadays, people talk about a transformation of energy uh, you know, into oneness or, or, or whatever. The interesting part, this is a bit of an aside, but the interesting part, when I pull all that together and I say, now you're telling me that when you die, you think it's like a transformation. Well, or let, let me talk about myself. I say, I, they say to me, what do you think is going to happen when you die? I have no idea. I have no idea. Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> I have no idea. It's a transformation from a three-dimensional way of existence, of energizing, into a non three-dimensional way. Does the energy that is somehow comprises the 60 trillion cells in my body, does it go on? I believe it does. Will I be conscious of being Michael Moore with my Michael Moore awareness when I die? That's the greatest question I have tried to face in the last 20 years. And I'm inclined to say no. That's difficult. Even saying it now, I find it difficult. Because then people say, oh, but what about meeting my mother or my father or my wife or my children? I say, yes, I will meet my mother. I will meet my father and my brothers and sisters. But it's not going to be in a three-dimensional way. It's going to be in an energy that is beyond my comprehension. 
So I hold on, I hold on to a communion of, of, of saints. So th no, there's no heaven. There's no heaven. There's no judgment when we die for heaven's sake. And it's like, yeah, yeah. There is no, there is no, no being out there waiting to zap us when we die. There's, there's no judgment. It's transformation into energy. And the best image I have of that that I used when I was practicing as a priest was Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. And I use that, that image, it's the walk into the embrace. It's the image, it's, it's the image of, am I capable of walking into the embrace of pure oneness, of pure love, pure essence? Can I do that? What would make that impossible? That's the question. And there's not one of us here, there's not one of us here that would make that impossible. Not one of us. So let's live in that sense. I mean, what the Christian church is so... See, it's a control mechanism, isn't it? Eh? You do as we say or we'll send you to hell. I mean, come on, that's a perfect control mechanism by middle management. <laughs> You've never done that, have you, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've wished it on several people. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Who of us hasn't? Mm. Who of us hasn't? I think we have exhausted you, and um, I, I want to thank you for coming tonight, and I want to thank Michael. I wish we had more time with you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank Good you night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.